intriguing. And, for example... Oh, I'm wondering whether I should wire you up. I don't know, Mr. I really don't know what's happening. I have well, you must mind, since you're talking... Back to that, I must get back to that travel agent. Yes, we, we shall show But while you're talking, Paul, why don't you be wired? All right, I'll be wired. Uh, that, that way we won't be responsible for... Okay, yes, yes, I don't think it works. Is it turned on? Well, I'm looking for the earphones so that I can establish that. <laughs> I don't know where they've gone. I don't know. How do I... Could you just uh, well pretend it's worthwhile? Uh, you think it's worth pretending? Uh, oh, it's always worth pretending. Why? Like, I'm like pretending to speak for that. It's running this tape recorder. You can't know whether the damn thing is turned on or not. Not the phone. Oh, it's really, it's turned on, but the question is. Government's question is turned on. To do what? Yes, to what? Uh, I think the, the Paul gave me some symptoms that I might use yeah, to induce its function. I'm not trying to determine where you plug the microphone in. Yes, well, it's a very good idea. You think anything's plugged in? I mean, the. I think even one of those two other. No, I see. Now we seem to no, we seem to have plugged the two microphones into the thing called headphones. Oh, no, that was wrong. I think it's from a grip of the microphone. Uh, that is to say, there's something called microphones. Yeah, well, I think that very broken the headphone microphones. Um. I would strongly suspect. Uh, let me see whether that uh, tentatively would make any sense. Yeah. Does that make any sense? No, is it, I don't has it broken the microphones? Does anything ha Yes, well, that does make sense. Yes, it, has it broken the microphones at all? No, no. It hasn't. Uh, no, you're, you're, oh, you're wow. se you seem to be there. Well, great. I mean, uh, at least one of them works. I wonder if they both work. Does that one work, too? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, mm. All right. So as you as you battle, well, if it would remind me to phone that travel agent yes, back know. because it's essential and really is rather important, uh, as soon as Paul produces a number of the name of the firm, I, um, I have to put them to my accountant in Montreal. Um, this is what went through yesterday. They were saying that you can use a thing like cast either in a very strict mode where literally the equipment is being used to detect the condition we discussed at some length and even axiomatized a little called um, agreement over an understanding. For each topic in a, a thing called an entailment mesh, which is the ordered union, uh, an entailment structure rather, ordered union of several prunings, different head prunings of uh, an entailment mesh. Uh, in fact, it, it started out, the work started out on work on learning strategies and uh, learning styles and uh, improvement of tutorial learning conditions. It uh, started out uh, in context of these structures, uh, which served really as a backdrop against which to represent knowable topics and topics which could be explained by access to one of those facilities indicated in the in the books, or a, a thing like uh, TDS, or, or or like hunks, hunks or TDS, uh, which would be another environment, um, a normal one for learning with some kind of, kind of laboratory or simulation, or even in simulation involving people, actors, and so on, um, but monitored in any case uh, by a machinery. And you strict cast, you know, it's A on, on that mm -hmm. board up there. Uh, this funny figure, which is sort of signature of the upper left-hand corner and has a small table on it, is use of strict cast for understanding all topics. Uh, in other words, it is literally the case that a uh, student is required, he can go wherever he likes, he can aim wherever he likes, he can do things in different orders, many things at once or whatever, but in that sense it's entirely free, but this condition of agreement over an understanding, uh, in fact a self-agreement induced by presenting for each topic, apart from its description, a one or more, or as many as needed, of a list of demonstrations, which nowadays we call extensions of a measure, in fact, um, and eliciting, uh, by way of an explanatory reply, some explanation, literally making a physical model or some other kind of model, which in turn works successfully without, uh, not just gives the right answer, this is very important, it isn't 
the job of ticking multiple choice questions or saying something as kind to the machine as indeed I understand as one does in as one version like this of, of a cast implementation, which is uh, trial. I mean, it's just initial program. But literally, of course, that you explain in a way which is not included in any demonstration of scene. You build so you a, a model of the works. Yes, literally, you teach it back, and you do it actually by making very often, usually, in fact, a model which operates and serves to work uh, and do whatever it's meant to do, and, uh, but do it in any way you like. In other words, it can be any of your, your procedures can be converted into a thing like a program or a working model, depending rather on the facility employed, and maybe one or more of them, there's several in case of analogy, uh, and that actually operates tune it up or fiddle with it yourself in so doing, uh, of course, I mean, the student's allowed to do that, as he would be a laboratory. In fact, a laboratory is not a bad paradigm, but nevertheless, the, the synthesis works, or whatever it is. It may be quite a different one to any that's been demonstrated. It can have ingenuity in it, often does, if so much I can capture this. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, Strict cast then means that uh, you use this uh, condition for all possible, uh, all topics that are addressed by the student. Uh, Paul, was not difficult to travel in? Uh, now, B is a loose cast. Uh, result B up on that one. That's to say, you do insist upon strict cast at the beginning of a all of these learning sessions are about subject matters of some size. I think we've already chatted about that. The whole course is they're not just trivial little bits of laboratory learning, and uh, they're quite lengthy. Uh, and uh, typically would uh, take place over a couple of terms of school or something, admittedly. Um, they're compressed in a different way here. Uh, uh, at the beginning, you you take uh, the strict cast condition, understanding, uh, and insist upon it. You then leave the accessing and the exploration and, the, in fact, the learning strategy facility there uh, for use and guidance to this uh, the student. But you don't insist upon a strict understanding of each topic. In other words, you allow for merely a, an answer which is sufficient. Um, might be questioning of some kind. Uh, and then you periodically go back and put in some strict uh, cast topics, a few strictly understood topics, where there is an agreement over understanding. And condition C is, is, is normal learning, which, as far as I can see, ma matches up more or less with tutorial. Uh, in a classroom condition, mm -hmm. uh, with a reasonable teacher, uh, or um, CAI, if it's reasonably liberal, is very often useful, but it, we're taking more or less a lump thing here. And there isn't that much difference, quite honestly, either in retention or rate between them. I mean, in classroom obviously tends to be skip things and so on a bit. Between conventional CAI Well, not really, no, it's, it's peanuts. I mean, the difference is... Well, conventional CAI, uh, normal learning, uh, self-study, um, guided study, tutorials in class uh, with lectures. Okay. So, I mean, not, not, not a vast difference, honestly. And I, any of the, either of the indices used here, which are examination by explanatory type questions, mm -hmm. Uh, which are explanatory, and um, but there's the, no different great deal. So I've got uh, three conditions essentially to look at. One is where strict cast is used, one is where loose cast is used in some similar equipment, and C is where there is, you know, a control sample, if you like, which is, is more or less smudged over reasonable types of instruction as given in institutions, as given in, as people adopt by reading on their own, etc., outside the institution, and with estimates of how long it takes them as well. Um, hence we're measuring a thing called rate, uh, which is the speed of learning, and a thing called, which I've called knowledge here, which is a pompous name for it, 
uh, it leads us into the topic of AI. And uh, knowledge is, is, is an examination by explanatory type question, which will actually probe in some depth into the ability of a student to reconstruct uh, a concept. Um, there are a couple of occasions on which they are done in this table, these measures are taken in this table over the same people, whatever that means. And it led me to doubt that it had much meaning, incidentally, because uh, it can be argued that uh, people are not easily uh, identifiable as, as heads. Uh, and in many respects are not identifiable only as heads. I mean, uh, however, it's a conventional you know, thing to do, and the result of doing so is quite interesting. And these measures are taken uh, more or less immediately after learning, in fact, often during phases of it even. Um, and that's the first column. Um, the other column is tested uh, in respect to performance in both ways again uh, after uh, about a year. And hence the result was quite a lengthy presentation. And the result was quite unexpected. Uh, the first one is, the first column is, is, I guess, predictable enough. If we look at the speed of learning, the rate of learning, you might expect the normal learning is faster than non strict cast, which in turn is faster than strict cast. If we look at knowledge, the result is gratifying. The knowledge in cast is actually very much greater than the knowledge apparent in strict cast, mm -hmm. and that is very much greater than, sorry, a strict cast is very much greater than uh, loose cast, apologies, apologies inverted it. Uh, strict cast is much greater knowledge <laughs> than loose cast, and that in turn is much greater attention, which again is very gratifying than you'd, you expect or do find from the classes of students who study the subject matter and come from the same population, people are willing to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and so statisticians are, yeah, fair enough, I mean. Uh, the next result after a year is more surprising or intriguing, in fact, was a surprise and uh, caused the experimentation to embark upon. Um, it's also very gratifying. Um, I certainly hadn't planned to do any serious experiments of this kind to begin with, um, because I thought they would be pointless. Mm -hmm. But um, some subjects were in this condition in any case, and uh, we tried it. Mm -hmm. Here we find that the rate of strict cast is less, of course, than the rate of loose cast which is somewhere near to the rate of this uh, condition of school study and so on. It's a bit greater, but uh, not much. Okay. The understanding, this is where the surprise is, of the loose cast is better than the understanding of the strict form and is much better again than the understanding here where it's almost zero. Most people don't know, can't, hello. can't explain uh, what in the world they've learned about. I mean, they just have no, no concept of They've learned the formula, they've learned some names and tag words, they have even learned a few rules that they don't know how to apply them. And uh, they are not a mess on the whole. I don't even know this as well as I do. It's a typical result you get when you examine in depth or question in depth how many students really know anything about thermodynamics. Uh, they can do the rituals of it <laughs> and get through an examination, which is a very different objective. Well, uh, here we find I see, that loose cast is very much better than straight, and it's better than that. So what seems to happen is this in the first period of loose cast, people learn to learn. And uh, there is some independent evidence that this process can be induced by causing them, amongst other things, to construct analogy relations of their own. And there are various inducers, if you like, or probes or problems which will lead people to learn to learn. At any rate, they have certainly experienced how they learn, and they've experienced what it means to understand something, and the advantage of doing so early intuition 
Later, they don't always insist upon this, so they go back to it, ruminate upon it, mull over it in their heads, and think about it, and apply the same sort of techniques to other areas and other topics. And this um, gives rise to a very interesting result, namely that after a period of rumination, folk who have done this with one subject tend, first of all, generalized over other, which you haven't got it on the board, but also they tend to in that any one subject area, uh, apply what they've learned in the first arduous bits and what been, they've been reminded of periodically. Uh, they apply this to every topic, but they do it informally in their heads as a mental construction operation. And this now becomes just about as good uh, as having the strict condition enforced. Yes. And in fact, the, I put down 85 90 percent. It, it either occurs or does not, uh, and uh, the, the result is, is put up as a kind of statistical result, otherwise it would be a rank ordering. Uh, those who do this, uh, which are 85 or 90 percent of people, are a larger number. Um, you know, um, are, are just rank ordered better uh, than the others, and it's not a, it's not a tatty result at all. Have you given the overview of that sheet because I may have a bridging question. Yeah. I think which is great. Okay. What is it what is it about ca uh, strict cast to loose cast and the nature of the knowledge representation here that makes this system memorable in its way as opposed to other knowledge representation schemes or well, other schemes? I'm not quite sure I might be able to answer that in a moment. I mean I can only conjecture. I've I've already in a sense, conjecture. By the way, did you phone the travel agent? You? you have that. <laughs> well, the um, the um, I can conjecture, and I quite like to. One um, feature of it can be uh, examined by looking at a slightly different aspect of learning, namely the styles and strategies people adopt. And strategies, I said before, I mean something very different. And by style, I mean a principle. Now, uh, here we find that you people do uh, adopt the surprising generality given the style, okay. Uh, this uh, is applied to a variety of subject matters, which is surprising, largely due to the bias of institutional life. Um, next, we find that if we mismatch. What do you, get, what do you mean by. Largely due to the bias of institutional life. Uh, I mean that the examination system and the um, mores uh, tutorial system, particularly the time constraint, the time restrictions on class, uh, yes. bells ring, and so forth, induce a, a more or less linearized study by mandate. Okay. And this does, in fact, suit some people. It doesn't suit others. But even if it doesn't suit them, they okay. somehow adapt to it and do the best they can to translate into these terms when it comes to really doing examination. They're really flung otherwise. Uh, what they do really is to learn examination skills if they're not good at this particular thing. But you just think about an institution, it's very difficult to arrange it in any other manner than this, I mean, in practice. And, um, so by institutional constraints, I mean there's not necessarily malicious at all constraints which are embedded in nearly every educational system of an institutional kind and only seldom avoided. They are avoided, for example, in the architectural association because that is not run like such an institution. Uh, they're avoided in, in certain other places, but a very deliberately different type of institution and atmosphere has been built up to promote anything other than this sort of learning, uh, especially when you are clobbered with the syllabus and the curriculum structure. Now, the interesting thing is that um, if you look differently at the matter, because first of all, we looked at how you learn uh, over these internal meshes and so forth, uh, as a, a map background, uh, and next we look at um, tests in which you tell this story. I haven't, have I been into these tests at all? Style tests? Yeah. No, so. Well, there are a couple of stylistic tests. I'll briefly describe them. Uh, they're both very similar. Uh, very briefly describe them to indicate um, 
what I'm all about. Before you do that, just in a, mm -hmm. in a nutshell, summarizing that you make a distinction between styles and strategies. I do indeed. And I think that should be explicated. Just well, I think. In a sense, we, we referred to this earlier, as far as I recall it, yeah. in, these, uh, in these discussions, but... I don't think we had a real it's, um, Ah. Well, a strategy, I will define first, because this is, is very well defined, and it's best defined by looking at those pictures that we've borrowed and pulled from one of the books, yeah. the pictures of learning strategies. Uh, I think the one on um, the statistics of learning is probably the best, because, I mean, I'll show you a strategy rather than saying what I mean is uh, I'm going to show you a couple of markings on graphs, which are graphs of topics, which are in fact unions of pruning of meshes of topics. And uh, uh, recorded on these, there is indeed a thing called a, a learning strategy, which consists of what people explore, what they aim for. Thank you for What people explore, what they aim for, and so on. And um, I'll give you some pictures here to show. Um, the details of transactions don't matter that much. They depend rather, rather upon how you elicit the self-agreement over an understanding. Uh, the rectangular boxes indicate uh, topics that are understood. Um, although superficially, these pictures look as though you have to somehow look at the lowermost topics first. This is not case. Uh, in other words, you can actually approach a thing from any angle, even in these quite crude systems you could. That's one of the systems. That's one of the experimental systems used. When you come around here, it's easier than lighting this place. Eh? You can't see. Um, that's the sort of equipment which was in use. Mm -hmm. This thing here, and later one in schools, I'll show you. Um, that's one kind of learning strategy plotted out over that thing. But that thing's been sort of rectangularized for display, mm -hmm. for printed mm -hmm. purposes. The um, triangular marks indicate called aims. This is a modeling facility, by the way. Called aim points. The circular sort of marks indicate things that are being worked on, like goals, or sub goals or something. And these frames each correspond to the understanding of the topic. Mm -hmm. They're not equally spaced in time, for example. They're certainly not equal in time. They're equal in probably the, the order of events relevant to learning. Now, this is a very different matter, because it's a, a temporal map on the sort of topology that Ron Atkin is talking about, rather than upon a Newtonian map on the clock. Um, and here we go on, and what we have in here is a learning strategy of one Polish type student. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, he's using a lot of analogies, so playing around. Uh, this is a typical learning strategy for a serious type mm -hmm. student. Now the class of those characterized by the placement of tokens either in a, a generalized, played out manner with a liberal use of analogy and lots of topics being worked on at once. Um, and even though, as a matter of fact, in this thing only one could be understood at once, which is phony, as a matter of fact, because in fact a large number are being understood, <laughs> what, what it really means, um, you can classify such graph markings in this way, and uh, you can numericize it as you like, but at least, I mean, this is an accurate account mm -hmm. of what goes on, and, uh, and nobody can complain that isn't hard psychological data. And, um, people do tend to adopt these styles, very, very, these, these strategies quite strongly. And their tendency is just a piece of the sampling equipment, um, probably in certain regulation heuristic. And these are um, oh, further pictures of the same kind of thing, different subject matter. And um, some pictures of the later equipment, kind of thing we use in the school. And so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no point in recapitulating right. the books uh, here, and uh, but it gives an idea. So, what I mean by a learning strategy as a holistic or a serialist is specific, and it can be classified when I have one, and it's a definite thing. Somebody does a, they, they do tend to fall into one of these two classes, and quite reasonably, having invested, it is like cognitive dissonance, 
having invested effort in building up methods of tackling subject matter, uh, people are loath to relinquish them, and uh, it's hardly surprising. And there is one very strong result, very early result, which it comes out of looking at these strategies. Uh, they are, of course, uh, learning strategies as depicted, but they can always be taken as paradigms for teaching strategies. So if you were a teacher wanted to recommend somebody who was known to be of a certain disposition, uh, how do you learn? Uh, you would either take one or other of these paradigms, or perhaps somebody who learned to learn a mix of them, and make recommendations accordingly. Uh, you might even, indeed, go so far as to do something silly like write a CAI program, which was based only on that, and then say, well, this is normally the best or something. And that would be silly, because there is an early result which uh, looks at the case of match, mismatch. Uh, any. Uh, well, what happens is that if you match strategies, if you match some index of style, as you was obtained in those days by a preliminary run to a variety of subject matters, if you match style, uh, um, learning effective, both in terms, actually, both to some extent in terms of speed, but not so much in terms of speed, in terms of retention. If you match the... Uh, uh, learning strategy, yeah, match, learning is effective. Match, teach, learn. Mm -hmm. So if uh, you take somebody with a disposition, have a, say, a holy strategy, and this is the manifest over certain subject matters, and... Uh, you match it to a holistic type teaching strategy which you enforce more or less or strongly recommend. You don't quite enforce it because it's a class of strategies. Um, and then you, you get better learning than just leaving them alone. Mm -hmm. So match is, is on the whole better than giving no guidance. I'm going to phrase not equal to no guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas mismatch is very much better. In fact, there is none. There's a mismatch. Absolutely no relevant learning occurs at all. In other words, if I grossly mismatch somebody for their style, as man it is, and am really prohibitive about it, and that can be pretty prohibitive in the match case, uh, then in the mismatch case, it's a very, very strong result indeed. Absolutely nothing relevant is learned about the subject matter. A lot is learned about the experimenter. A lot is learned about, I mean, it isn't people are being idle or they're just learning about things which the experimenter or teacher does not deem particularly relevant. Uh, and we can only hope many teachers, in fact, work on this principle. Uh, and in fact, there's a good evidence they do, uh, in fact, work on this very principle. They know perfectly well that some members of their class are simply not learning anything relevant about the subject matter, but they give them cues to get advice, do reading or something, which they do learn about and they do. And a lot of good tuition in schools and the like is done just that way. I mean, look at the whole process and it comes out that way. Well, they have to use a more or less serialistic strategy because of the school system. They know that a lot of their students simply won't do it. They give them something of interest them by dilution, peripheral materials, backup, supportive materials, whatever stories, bits of history. Uh, they learn this because it is, of course, attached to the linear sequence at all. And they get interested enough to go away and read about in their own manner outside the class what's happening. And a lot of teachers know this really is what's going on. And then they also, they can't avoid the institutional constraint. Some of them try to match, and this occurs more often when there isn't pressure from examinations. So you'll get it very frequently uh, amongst younger children, for example, where there isn't any great examination pressure. And uh, you, you get it at periods in the school when you have a, you know, a moment when you're not under pressure to get the examinations done or the important ones. I mean, I'm talking not about the school examination, nearly so much as the examinations which qualify, like O-levels, A-levels, um, and so on. And, um, 
which are important. And this is, is I mean, teachers, I, I find these stuff, on the whole, pretty conscious of this process, if they're good, if they're teachers rather than well, playing at teachers, as it were, being a kind of tape recorder with an authoritative voice attached to it, which um, I wouldn't regard as being good teaching, I wouldn't. I? Now, another thing you can do is to look around more detail what these styles mean. And there are tests. Are these the same as lumpers and stringers, essentially? Uh, there appears to be an enormous sort of resemblance, yes. Uh, it's not quite the same as lumpers and stringers, but it's the same at an intellectual level, and there is a lot of resemblance. But they don't cross correlate for the obvious reason too well unless you set special circumstances up. In other words, you've got into a different domain with those perceptual motor skills. You're not in the institutional domain. And you don't necessarily get the same biases and you don't get the same behavior carrying over. Um, um, I mean, all of this work is an attempt, in some sense, to exteriorize it. It's a personal one, exteriorize relevant conversation theoretic events uh, so that they can be observed, uh, conceptual events and thoughts and so on, so that they can be observed. And um, in, in this sense, one is looking at behaviors, obviously, there are very special kinds of behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, when you, when you um, do this, you, you find that, uh, indeed, OK, there is some correlation, actually, in the case of skills which approach the context of lumping and strain, a good deal between the, the serial and the stream type and the conceptual and the, uh, and the holistic and the clumping type. But in general, in academic subject matter, you don't get this carryover. Uh, you don't get this carryover from one domain to another that you do get between subject matter and school or between perceptual motor skill. Mm -hmm. And it's in a sufficiently different domain. Mm -hmm. And nearly everybody operates, in fact, in several methods, obviously. And it's almost a platitude, I guess. If you've forgotten by individual different psychologists, but uh, there are studies of uh, even personality, uh, which shows it, of course, to be context dependent. Um, well, nice studies in which uh, do a beeper trick on people and make them they fill out a profile in different contexts, in transport, cafe, home, school, whatever. Uh, in fact, you find a whole lot of different personalities there, which is rather irritating to the personality theorists. Um, but indeed, it's perfectly true. It's very obvious, but no matter of common sense. It must be evident to the theorists in question. So the lumpers and stringers came but, out of some other No, I would suggest, studies, oh yes, it came out of some other studies, I mean, but would, I mean, we had a, an impression from that, of course, that this is the kind of thing to look for. All I'm saying is that somebody who lumps uh, in a sort of perceptual motor domain, which is outside the constraints, outside the context of institutions usually, mm -hmm. Um, doesn't necessarily, uh, unless you take care in the domain of academia or whatever, uh, uh, do a, a holistic strategy or vice versa, a string or do a serialistic one. If you actually are careful in the tasks you employ and try to make gradation of context and keep the contextual surroundings very similar, as a matter of fact, you do get a correlation. And you get a considerable time. I just wanted to clean what is interesting, you know, it, this was done, one of Dekas Vargas' people and another guy, Dan Lurla, one of Dan Lurla's people who worked an awful lot on this, have done specific experiments on that thing. And um, it's um, now coming to, uh, now, now come to the question of tests for, for, for style, mm -hmm. because getting on to some of the very large experimental series which were done, large studies, I would say, a program, really, several programs, about half and half. Uh, well, I said the majority is supported by the US. Uh, um, or, well, let's say half and half, at least. Uh, a very large program supported by the Social Science Research Council in the UK, uh, work at the Home Office and the Research Lab, etc. Um, and it formed a very big program, so we had to have some sort of stylistic guideline. 
and devised a couple of tests called smugglers. Inspiring. And made sure that these tests, in fact, were sampling the same kind of thing. They had a validity, but in the sense that they were sampling the same sorts of um, process. Um, I'll illustrate with one, which is the, the, the spiring history test, and just indicate the other in outline. You're given uh, between three and five years, usually we use three years, uh, of, um, first of all, a background of a scenario. The whole test procedure occupies several hours. I will do it on you, which would be ideal. Uh, of uh, aspiring between years 18 and 93, 1894, and 1895, which are uh, of which we're reported to have and do have indeed accurate information there are five spies in the ring who play different roles and perform different jobs. They all have different characters, and they live in some live in the same country, some in different countries, and they're concerned with transmission of messages uh, of a type obtained by espionage between themselves in favour of some external power. Um, the things they can do with the messages are, in fact, representable as a petrinet representation, as a process of representation, and they're. The students who are doing this test are told all this, and they said, well, well, we're going to show you the teletype messages coming out, mm -hmm. uh, which show the transactions each year. And uh, if you're going to learn about these spies, a good idea if you learn about them. Uh, we also allow them to do what people do anyhow, and transform these into a directed graph, which gives part of the picture. And the directed graph itself is a type called a cartoon, which was invented by Cappy at the uh, name uh, and procedure invented by a chaffee at the uh, Georgia Tech for a graph product, uh, which um, you can apply, you know, it's, it's a matter of applying some function to graphs, which is actually a reasonable interpretation of what changes go on in these countries, and I'd indicate it to some extent. Um, having accumulated this data, and after all, as a list learning procedure, it's impossible, and the directed graph learning would be insufficient. And I say, well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> very nice of you to learn all that stuff. Actually, what happened, please, in, in, um, in 1896, could you draw me? They've been drawing, of course, the, you're looking at these directed graphs, and they've been looking at these, uh, these lists of, of, uh, of messages passed, which are not all that many, there are about eight messages a year, sufficient to characterize them uniquely. The, the rules follow during that year, uh, and the graph form, of course, changes between different years, according to events which may cut links or whatever, and uh, replace them. Although, as a matter of fact, the same espionage agents, the same spies, stayed on duty throughout the whole period. They survived. What, did they, what happened in 1896? Are they still survived in 1896? Right? Now, um, I wonder if, first of all, you could indicate to me a, uh, a graph or other depiction in the paper of how what this ring looked like in 1896. I'm just naming the spies, and, and uh, they are they named Euclid and Barrett and so on, code name, and uh, there are five of them, three used to do. Uh, and uh, well, what did it look like in 1896, for which you haven't had any information? There's no, there's no correct answer to this. It's a matter of conjecture, but we were locked and lost the record. But uh, there are lots of reasonable conjectures you might make, so what do you say? And then you say, well, look, uh, that's fine, that gives an overall picture, but what would be the messages uh, that were transmitted in 1896? Perhaps you would just write a list down. I don't mind how long it is, you know very well that uh, probably about eight would be enough to characterize it. That, you know, we took a lot of care over these characterizations, in fact, and uh, there's no need to get a minimal list, just put down something which is characteristic of the transactions going on to know what these guys were doing in 1896. And so you fill out this 
these. Uh, first of all, you give the um, map of the country, in fact. And then you give uh, a um, graph for 1896. And then you give behavior for 1896. Um, well, after this slight jerk, because you weren't really expecting, it was always something about learning, uh, to be asked to predict <coughs> uh, something, you now ask them to recall 1893 in, in the same way, 1895, uh, which they have already seen, as well as they can. Um, then you finally say, well, what the hell do you think was going on? Can you tell me a story about it? And often, in some data, fortunately, enough people did to be able to classify the story. In other words, they, it's a very chancy thing. It was put in uh, as not an option, really, but as something at the end so that it wouldn't actually prevent the rest of the test being carried out. Um, we did um, a study with these tests in which they were included. Um, And uh, it was a four-fold study using a very large sample for psychological purposes, uh, in which we compared balanced groups of several hundred people uh, who, in the first session, did, amongst other things, spies, um, whereas others first did smug. Mm -hmm. Then they did tests, other tests, analogous tests, things like that, other psychometric instruments, standard one. Then they did either smugs for that lot or spies for that lot. Right? And some more tests, projection matrices, etc., that kind of stuff. And looked at the whole lot. It got interesting uh, results. I mean, statistically, the tests are reliable in the sense that people who, at this point, have showed one kind of style in smugglers, correlated with people who showed that same behavior in spies. So that's kind of gratifying. The test could be deemed reliable, who they were anyhow. And uh, well, all spies in that, and smugglers in that. And they weren't biased for positional order very much. But, um, and they're both, I and mean, the other is about manufacture of heroin, in fact, from, from opium poppy. Uh, and it uh, gives a fairly reasonable, uh, not really effective synthesis, amongst other things. And it's, um, it's, uh, it's of use, uh, as well as um, of amusement. And um, if you want to make your own heroin, I'm afraid if you use the synthesis suggested, you blow yourself up probably in the process, but it is practical. However, here we are. And, um, well, it requires a sort of ether extraction thing, which is damn dangerous. Um, and um, it um, is surprising, actually, though, that the correlation is quite as high as it is. Because we're not looking here at strategies, we're looking at style. The perfectly ordinary way, which I've described it. Looking at ability to be versatile, analogize the fact construct an analogy between 1896 and the sequence of things here. That is creating an analogy, really. You're asked to make something analogous to, but not the same as, and continuing what the typical behavior of this ring, which is sort of, which is sort of periodic, really, have a possible inference collection for 1896 and match the responses against it. It isn't just a question of matching lists, it is a question of matching possibilities of petri nets with certain rules and the transformation of petri nets and the operators which are determined by the history of the country. But there's no unique answer at all. Um, and uh, hence one get a, a measure of style, I think it's fair enough. And it was surprising we got correlation here in the order of between 0.49 and 0.65 between the scores into test correlations. Um, they, are, they are much higher than the cross correlations in any but the best of these general tests, which are far less specific. 
and we are looking at total score, and they are hardly correlated at all, nor are the problem type tests like progressive matrices or the problem tests like simple analogies tests and related figures and so on, Wiccans, uh, field dependent, field independent tests. Uh, they